Christian tradition says there are four Gospels. Archaeologists say there are more, many more, hidden and banned by the early church. What is in these newly discovered scriptures, and why were they forbidden for centuries? Cutting-edge technology reveals the secret history of Christianity buried in the lost Gospels. The Bible, it is sacred scripture to billions, full of miracles and mysteries. Yet new breakthroughs in technology suggest that the fantastic tales and miracles have a basis in fact. Can science reveal the truth behind the Bible's greatest mysteries? Winter 1886. French archaeologists dig for artifacts in the Christian section of a cemetery in Upper Egypt. Suddenly, they make a discovery that shakes Christian history to its core. What they uncover is the long-forgotten grave of a monk buried in the 8th century. But the real find is what the monk is taking with him to the next world. Those who buried the monk apparently took this little papyrus book and put it with the monk. So that in a way he could go into the next life with one of his favorite books. It includes not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it includes the Gospel of Peter. The book apparently is an actual gospel, a first hand account of the life of Jesus, yet the text claims to have been written by the Apostle Peter. For nearly 2,000 years, everything Christians knew about Jesus came from the Gospels of the Christian Bible, accounts by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Could this be an actual lost account of the life of Jesus, written by Simon Peter, the hand-picked leader of the Apostles? The discovery set off shockwaves throughout the world of biblical scholarship, and that shockwave continues as new Gospels, lost Gospels, emerge from numerous archaeological digs. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and even the Gospel of Judas. The discovery of the lost Gospels also reveals a secret battle now forgotten, but once vital. A battle for the soul of Christianity. On the one side is a devout group calling for a direct spiritual relationship with God, with their own set of Gospels. On the other side, a growing hierarchy of Orthodox Christianity that accepts only four Gospels. The result of this battle would determine the future of Christianity. But at the very beginning days of the faith, there literally was no gospel and no Christian Bible. Christianity begins around the year 30 AD with a group of Jews who follow the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. We tell history through stories, and this was certainly the case with the early Jesus movement. The people that were around Jesus, the poor, the marginalized, they most likely couldn't read or write, so they did what everybody else did. They told stories. People must have talked to each other. Now, you knew Jesus. What did he say when you met him? Were you there when he was walking down the road? Do you remember the story? What I heard was this. The stories of Jesus were not written down for decades. Scholars believe the earliest gospel, the Gospel of Mark, was written about 70 AD, 40 years after the death of Jesus. But his was not the only gospel. By the year 200 AD, there were not just the four gospels. There may have been as many as 50. They bore titles like the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of the Hebrews, and the revelation of Peter. 
Some of these books were mentioned by ancient writers, but until recently, these Gospels had all disappeared. What happened to them, and why are there only four Gospels today? The answer comes down less to faith and more to politics. The Bible didn't fall out of the sky. The Bible was finally put together by Christian thinkers who represented a particular point of view. The surprising fact is that the Christian Bible as we know it didn't really emerge until 300 years after the death of Jesus. And the man who determined the content of the Christian Bible had a powerful agenda that had little to do with religion. In 312 AD, a Roman emperor named Constantine, a pagan who believed in multiple gods, claimed to have had a vision of the cross before a battle. After his victory, he became a convert to the religion of Christianity, eventually making it the semi-official state religion. Constantine wanted to harness this new religion in order to unify a Roman empire that was falling apart. At that time, Christianity was a loosely organized religion, a collection of churches with diverse beliefs and diverse scriptures. The emperor intended to change that. What he noticed, however, was that these people aren't very well organized. And if there's one thing that Romans knew how to do, it was to get things organized. In 325 AD, Emperor Constantine convenes the Council of Nicaea to decide the basic tenets of Christianity. He brings together the most powerful church leaders from around the world to discuss legalizing a formal Christian religion. One of the interesting things is, it becomes clear that what he is primarily interested in is in unity. He wants the Christian religion to provide the ideological basis for the empire. The goal of Constantine's council was to unify the faith, both religiously and politically. After weeks of debate, the various bishops and priests agree on a set of principles that unify all of Christianity and place the religion firmly under the control of the emperor. And he then used his authority to say, okay, guys, this is it. Things got drastically changed under Constantine. We have a complete redefinition of how God is to be understood God now is the protector of the state, which then seeks to use the religion for its own purposes, to unify everything, because you can't have much dissent and run a state. Constantine also unified the Christian Gospels and limited the Gospels he considered fit for the state religion. Though the Nicene Council did not officially decide on the content of the Christian Bible, Constantine made it clear which Gospels he considered acceptable. He commissioned the creation of 50 copies of a Christian Bible, which contained only the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What happened to the other Gospels? In 382 AD, another church council literally banned Christians from reading them. Under the Christian emperor Theodosius, all other gospels were considered heresy. Were banned or buried, their owners arrested and sometimes killed. There were all these other texts that real believing Christians loved. And for a long time, it must have been read until the bishops came around to say, thou shalt not read this, but thou shalt read that. What was contained in these lost gospels? What made them so threatening that they had to be banned or destroyed? No one knew for nearly 2,000 years. But in 1886, the gospel of Peter emerged from the sands of the Egyptian desert. Other astonishing discoveries followed in the 20th century. The Gospels of Thomas, of Mary Magdalene, of Judas. These lost Gospels reveal a very different view of Jesus, a different approach to spirituality, and a lost version of Christianity that once threatened the very foundation of the faith itself.
For nearly 2,000 years, Christians believed there were only four Gospels that told the story of Jesus of Nazareth. In 1886, the Gospel of Peter was the first lost gospel discovered in centuries, suggesting the existence of a secret history of forbidden scriptures. In 1945, a remarkable discovery unearthed a large collection of lost gospels and changed forever the history of Christianity. In Egypt, near a town called Nag Hammadi, a farmer and his companions found a sealed clay jar with an 1,800-year-old payload. The jar contained 52 separate texts with titles like the Acts of Peter, the Apocalypse of James, and the Gospel of Thomas. These were literal lost gospels, mentioned by ancient writers, but apparently buried after the Roman Emperor Constantine's consolidation of power in 325 AD. The scriptures had only existed as legends until now. And perhaps the most surprising of these lost scriptures was the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is a fascinating document. It was translated from Greek to Coptic, and it possesses sayings of Jesus. And a lot of the things that are contained within the Gospel of Thomas are also found in the New Testament. The difference being that the Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic Gospel. The Gnostics were a sect of early Christianity that had a deep emphasis on mysticism and that disagreed with many of the precepts of the emerging Christian hierarchy. Gnostics were saved by secret knowledge. You were a true follower of Jesus if you understood this secret knowledge. Gnosis is a Greek word meaning knowledge, and Gnostic means one who knows. They were essentially mystics in many ways. And if they could find that peace of God within, that true humanity within, why did they need to have any priest or any bishop? They could march to the beat of their own drummer. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus seems to convey a strange message, a secret teaching that is very different from the traditional Gospels. The traditional Gospels teach that Jesus is the only Son of God, the Gospel of Thomas suggests we can all become sons of God. It says, when you know yourselves, then you will be known and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. In other words, if Jesus can be taken as a child of God, so are all of us sons and daughters of God. He doesn't have anything that we can't have. We can have the same kind of relationship to the divine, that same kind of oneness with God. The Gospel of Thomas calls for a personal connection to God without the need for organized churches, priests, and bishops. There were lots of priests and bishops who took offense at these Gnostics who had their own way, had their direct kind of line, their red telephone to the divine. That did not sit well with the authority figures in the church. And that may be the reason the Gospel of Thomas was considered heresy. The independence of Gnostic beliefs undermined the church hierarchy. The Gnostics believed their own Gospels were just as valid, if not more so, than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the case of the Gospel of Thomas, they may have been right. When these Gnostic Gospels were discovered in 1945, a disturbing issue arose. It turned out that the lost Gospel of Thomas could conceivably be older than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
There is a debate among scholars uh, regarding how to date the Gospel of Thomas. What we do know is that we have some very early Greek papyri of the Gospel of Thomas. And it looks as if portions of the Gospel of Thomas are very early. In fact, portions of the Gospel of Thomas may go back to the earliest days of the church. Most scholars believe the four traditional Gospels were written within a generation of the death of Jesus, 40 to 60 years after the events actually took place. But material in the Gospel of Thomas may be older, based on its simpler content. The difference between the Gospel of Thomas and the New Testament is that the Gospel of Thomas only has the sayings of Jesus. There are no miracles, there are no stories about Jesus. The fact that the Gospel is only a collection of the sayings of Jesus may suggest it is more ancient, and that the narrative and storytelling elements in the other Gospels are later additions. If the Gospel of Thomas is really older than the four traditional Gospels, does that mean it is closer to the message of Jesus? And if this is so, does that mean the Christian Bible is literally incomplete? The answer may lie in finding the exact date the Gospel was written. The Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute, or MCI, deploys a team of specialists and scientists to extract the secrets of ancient documents. What we do is really like a detective. Our scientists would look with different kinds of instrumentation to understand really what it is, where it came from in the world. Scholars search for clues to the age of a gospel in the document's literal paper and ink. I feel like I can sometimes get into the head of the maker, especially because a conservator needs to develop kind of a backwards x-ray vision. You have this object in front of you, and it's come to you in its actual state and its condition, and you have to think about all of the things that happened to it. The Gospel of Thomas found at Nag Hammadi was given a carbon-14 test. The pages revealed that the copy was from approximately 300 to 400 A.D. The oldest copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come from approximately the same time. But scholars agree that all these Gospels must have been copies of much older texts, because ancient writers refer to these Gospels by 150 A.D. The exact age of the Gospel of Thomas is elusive and controversial. Is it older and more accurate than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Until a more ancient copy is found, the question remains a mystery. But no matter its age, the Gospel of Thomas reveals a battle within Christianity between two camps. The traditional church had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on their side. But the Gnostics claim to have the support of Mary Magdalene herself. For centuries, Christians believed that there were only four Gospels that revealed the life and message of Jesus of Nazareth. But that belief changed in the late 1800s with the discovery of the first lost Gospels. One of the most compelling of these forgotten scriptures was discovered in Egypt in 1896. A gospel with a very surprising author. It is a gospel written in the name of a woman. And not just any woman, but apparently Mary Magdalene. and not the Mary Magdalene who has a role in the church, who is the repentant whore and so forth. This is Mary Magdalene who is a beloved disciple. She's a part of the inner circle. Only a few fragments survive, but they put into sharp focus Mary's true significance. If the Gospel of Mary is authentic, it means that women were once powerful leaders in the Christian church. It means that Mary Magdalene was not a reformed prostitute, but the leader of the apostles. 
And in a religion dominated for centuries by men, it means the most important gospel was written in the name of a woman. The Gospel of Mary details the secret instructions that Jesus tells only to Mary, secrets about life, death, and heaven. In this Gospel, Jesus reveals certain things about the afterlife to Mary in very Gnostic kinds of terms. The afterlife in the four traditional Gospels is described as a blissful paradise. But in the Gospel of Mary, the afterlife involves a strange journey of the soul after death, in which the dead person encounters angelic and demonic beings as the soul makes its way to heaven. It is only to Mary that Jesus reveals this secret journey of the soul. The Gospel reports that Peter, the leader of the apostles, reacts explosively to this revelation. Peter says, did he really speak with a woman without our knowledge? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? In the Gospel, the apostles override Peter's denunciation and support Mary, saying, if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? What is significant is that there was a spiritual kind of bond, that Mary was thought to be a person of insight, a leader, somebody who had an ability to motivate others, and that was her real gift. She understood the mind of Jesus and was able to communicate that. This is a gospel that gives a very different kind of view of what the message of Jesus is and gives Mary Magdalene as the one who understands that point of view in a way that the other disciples did not. But is this text a real gospel? The eyewitness account of Mary Magdalene? If so, it might change Christian history and revolutionize the role of women in the Christian church. The key lies in the Gospel's age. Is it older than the four traditional Gospels? And could it have been written by Mary Magdalene herself? The Gospel of Mary was first discovered in 1896 in Achmen, Egypt. Carbon dating reveals this text was hand copied in the fifth century. But over the years, fragments of the Gospel of Mary have emerged elsewhere in Egypt, and they are much older. New breakthroughs in technology can help refine the exact date of even the smallest fragments of ancient text. Using the 3D microscope allows scientists to focus on the details that provide clues to its age. At this level of detail, a modern sample of papyrus bears no resemblance to an ancient text. If this were 2,000 years old, the uh, surface would not be so shiny. It would be more matte because uh, fibers would be uh, worn and creating a sort of a nap to, it, to the surface, almost like suede. Tests like these help provide a very precise date for the oldest fragments of the Gospel of Mary. They were written approximately 200 AD. Language and vocabulary also suggest that the Gospel of Mary was written during the second century and not during the time of Jesus. Thus, it is highly unlikely that Mary Magdalene wrote the Gospel that bears her name. Most scholars believe it was created by a Gnostic Christian during the second century who wanted to invoke the authority of the female apostle. We don't know who the author was, but many would imagine that there really is a woman's voice and a woman's perspective that is to be seen here. And it may be the case that finally there is a voice that is heard that is stifled in the other Gospels. Perhaps more importantly, the Gospel of Mary reveals a power struggle in the early church about the role of women. The whole idea of leadership of women is, uh, I think, a very exciting thing to look at. Uh, in this early Christian history, and the Gospel of Mary is a kind of a testimony to that. The fact that Mary is a leader and a woman is a revolutionary concept in the early church. The fact that there can be a Gospel of Mary 
indicates something of the fact that there were, in fact, folks like the Gnostics who are much more open to the inclusion of women as full members of the community. In fact, some of the people in the emerging Orthodox Church complained about this. You mean there are some women that are administering the sacraments? There are women that are ordained among these Gnostics? Shame on them. The Gnostics saw no shame in that. And so for there to be a text like a Gospel of Mary is perfectly in line with a Gnostic point of view. If the Gospel of Mary reveals the Gnostics' view on women, another Gnostic Gospel claims to present the account of Peter, head of the Apostles, and it is said to reveal the secret about what really happened at the resurrection of Jesus. French archaeologists working in Egypt uncovered an ancient Christian tomb with an extraordinary treasure. Clutched in the hands of an 8th century monk was a book called the Gospel of Peter. It was one of the first lost gospels ever discovered. Could this be an actual lost account of the life of Jesus written by Simon Peter? the hand-picked leader of the apostles? If so, it would change the history of Christianity, for the Gospel of Peter tells a very different version of the life of Jesus. What we have is very precious and very exciting. It's an early story, but an alternative story. In the Gospel of Peter, the Romans are surprisingly sympathetic. It says Jesus suffered no pain on the cross, but the most shocking difference, the Gospel of Peter claims to reveal an eyewitness account of the resurrection itself. It is the only Gospel that we have that attempts to tell the story of what happened during the resurrection. All the biblical Gospels talk about the results of resurrection, that the tomb was empty, but they don't try and talk about the moment of resurrection per se. The description begins on the third morning after the death of Jesus, as Roman soldiers guard the tomb of the fallen Messiah. The Gospel of Peter says, the tomb was opened, and those soldiers saw it, for they were keeping guard. And as they were explaining what they had seen, they saw three men emerge from the tomb. When they come out, they are supporting a third, supposedly Jesus, and then a deep voice comes and says, Have you then, have you then preached to those who have died? The resurrection ends with Jesus and the other figures rising into the sky, leaving the eyewitnesses to stare in wonder. The gospel ends with a line claiming that it is the eyewitness account of Peter the Apostle himself. Could this book really be the work of the lead apostle, the first pope? Was it written at the same time or earlier than the four traditional gospels? Or was it a later account, a forgery passing itself off as the eyewitness testimony of Peter? The archeological evidence is unclear. The gospel found in 1886 was dated from around 700 AD seven centuries after the death of Peter. Fragments have turned up in other sites from approximately 500 AD, still too late to have come directly from the apostle. We're gonna have a wonderful time mosaic in these things, thank God I'm not gonna have to do it. But the gospel was mentioned by early Christian writers. One bishop in what is now Turkey mentioned the book by name around 190 AD. We can trace the gospel back to the second century, but no further. In all likelihood, this is a second, early second century text. The reason we think it's an early second century text is because it uses material from all the four extant gospels that we have. The stories in the Gospel of Peter are so similar to other Gospels that it seems likely they were simply copied. 
whoever wrote this gospel in the second century claimed it was the work of Peter the Apostle to give it added authority, it was a common technique in the ancient world. When some people wanted to communicate some idea that they felt was true or important for the early Christian movement to hear, they wouldn't say it in their own voice, but they would say it in the voice of someone who they understood to have authority. In that sense, the Gospel of Peter was not a real account, but a forgery. But that brings up a point that is important and disturbing. If the Gospel of Peter is a forgery, then the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are also forgeries. We don't know who those authors were, but they were written in the name of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John because these were the great folks of the past. The fact of the matter is, they almost certainly were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most scholars agree that even the four traditional Gospels were not written by the apostles for whom they are named, but by followers of those apostles. If the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not, in fact, written by the apostles, then does that mean that the Gospel of Peter or the Gospel of Mary may be considered just as authentic? The answer is still unclear to historians. But there are elements in the Gospel of Peter that suggest it is not an eyewitness account by anyone, much less Peter the Apostle. The tale it tells contains highly suspect material. In the resurrection scene, Jesus and the two angelic beings are said to stretch up beyond the clouds. And behind Jesus in the tomb emerges the actual cross, which speaks. The gospel says, they heard a voice from the sky. Have you preached to those who were asleep? And the reply came from the cross, yes. The Gospel of Peter was too fantastic with these big guys whose head goes above the heavens and then a cross that talks. I mean, that, that's too much for anybody to believe if they want to be down to earth and sober in the early church. That may be one reason the Gospel of Peter was not accepted as a gospel when Constantine convened the Nicene Council. Yet there were still pockets of devout Christians who considered this book sacred. Sacred enough to be buried with a monk around 700 AD. I rather like the idea that there's a monk that is hanging onto this text, not only in this life, but in the next life. The Gospel of Peter was discovered in 1886, one of the first lost gospels ever found. And one of the most recent lost Gospels was only uncovered in 2006, a scripture that gained immediate controversy because it was said to be written by the betrayer of Jesus, the lost Gospel of Judas. The discovery of lost Gospels in the 20th century changed our understanding of Christian history. But a newly discovered lost Gospel questions the basic foundations of traditional Christian beliefs. In 2000, a papyrus document is retrieved from an antiquities dealer from Egypt. It is believed to have been originally found near Nag Hammadi, where the first Gnostic Gospels were discovered. It is identified as the Gospel of Judas. Judas Iscariot. When it was originally released, the hype was that Judas is a hero, that he's gone from being the traitor of Jesus, as he is in the biblical Gospels, to being this one who's exalted into the heavens because he simply carried out God's will. In the traditional Christian version of the crucifixion story, Judas betrays Jesus to the Romans and is scorned as a villain. But in this Gospel, the story of betrayal is twisted into a story of personal sacrifice. 
In the gospel, Jesus recognizes Judas as the wisest of the apostles. It really is all about Jesus and Judas. Judas is thought to be a very special disciple. He's the one who receives enlightenment, and he is the one who uh, seems to be most insightful in terms of who Jesus is. Jesus says Judas will deliver only his physical body to the Romans. He himself will escape crucifixion and return to the spiritual realm. This is a clear sign that the gospel has Gnostic roots. These guys didn't believe that Jesus was really human. He just appeared to be human. He was a spirit, if you will. And the whole idea of Gnosticism was to get rid of this cloak, this clothes, this human element, so that you could get back to the pure form of being spirit. It's a remarkable inversion of the traditional Christian Gospels and it was controversial from the moment it was published in 2006. If it is an authentic gospel written by Judas, it would rewrite Christian history and theology. But many scholars believe the gospel of Judas could only be a fake. The idea of a gospel of Judas Iscariot is so provocative that many people have wondered could it be that this, in fact, is a forgery? Theoretically, a person with a fiendish sense of humor or a desire to deceive the world could take some old papyrus and create a text and have a lot of fun with the world. The Gospel of Judas was subjected to weeks of investigation. Despite its unusual source, the experts determined it was not a forgery but probably not as old as the traditional Gospels. Scholars believe the Gospel of Judas is dated somewhere between 280 to 330 AD, almost 300 years after the death of Judas. It is clearly not an eyewitness account, and it was written later than the four traditional Gospels in the second century. The very creation of the Gospel of Judas highlights the growing conflict between Gnostic Christians and the traditional church around 300 AD. You write this Gospel and attribute it to Judas because it's a way of getting people to think differently about all the characters and, and to change the whole rules of the game, to flip the whole thing over so that if you bring the apostles down a notch and you bring Judas up somewhat, then you've reconfigured the way the world is seen because the Gospel of Judas is heavily criticizing the church that comes out of the apostolic roots. Using the character of Judas as its voice, the anonymous Gnostic writer wanted to hit the orthodox Christian beliefs squarely in the eye. As the Gnostic Christians grew more defiant, the orthodox church powers began planning to strike back. Before the Council of Nicaea, Christianity was not a structured organization. For its first 300 years, the Christian religion was a diverse faith with various beliefs and various gospels. But by the year 300 AD, the Gnostic movement within the religion was seen as a threat to the hierarchy of priests and bishops. The Gnostics and their Gospels emphasized a personal relationship with God without the need of a priest or an organized religious body. They really believed that there was something within, that they had a, a direct kind of access to the divine. They didn't really need to have priests and bishops. They didn't have to listen to that kind of authority. But the Gnostics' emphasis on mysticism and personal revelation perhaps led to their undoing. Instead of building community and gaining converts, the Gnostics' mystical select circle began to diminish in political clout. Meanwhile, an emerging Christian hierarchy was getting the attention of Roman politicians. 
With the Nicene Council in 325 AD, the Emperor Constantine solidified the power base of the more orthodox bishops and their hierarchy. The four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were in. The Gnostic Gospels were out. At least officially. It's important to keep in mind that these other Gospels that are not in the New Testament were in fact read by people and appreciated and loved by people for a long time. But what does this historic evolution of the New Testament say about the legitimacy of the Lost Gospels? The study of the Lost Gospels is actually very fascinating. It helps us to understand the cultural pressures that Christianity was under and what it was dealing with. It's rather fascinating to imagine what might have happened at Nicaea and after that if a Gnostic perspective might have carried the day. I would imagine that there would have been more of a mystical sense, more of an inner sense of what it means to be motivated as a follower of Jesus. It would have been a very different church with different characteristics and a different kind of sense, a more mystical sense. But the Gnostics did not carry the day at Nicaea. And somewhere in a monastery in the Egyptian desert, a group of Gnostic monks must have wondered about the fate of their beloved Gospels. They must have loved this kind of literature until that fateful day that Archbishop Athanasius of Alexandria announced to all the monks, it's time to throw away the heretical books and read the biblical books. Perhaps with a heavy heart, the monks took these precious books of the Nag Hammadi Library and they couldn't destroy them. So they hid them in a jar and they would last forever or almost forever, at least until we could find them in our day and read them anew. For millennia, the Holy Bible with the four Gospels of the New Testament has been held as the true story of Jesus. Some believe the lost Gospels reveal the road not taken for Christianity. Others believe the road was not taken for a reason. You know, the expression is that sometimes history is written by the winners. And the idea is that now the losers get to speak. And there is some value in hearing losers speak. But the other half of the expression needs to be said that sometimes the winners deserved to win. Centuries after they were consigned to the sands of the desert, the lost Gospels remain controversial to this day. And perhaps this very fact is a testament to the power of the written word to convey faith, hope, and mystery across the centuries and around the world.